Psychology is a relatively new field of study, and with it, as so is intelligence. So it's important to understand where intelligence actually came from, um, given it is such a controversial topic today and has been for the last few years. In order to, in my opinion, in order to have an opinion on it, you do need to see where the roots of intelligence have come from and where they've progressed and where they are today and how we measure it today. We won't go fully into the details of all the different ways they measure it today. This is just, you know, a beginner's guide to having an opinion on intelligence. So intelligence is sadly not an objective means of measuring someone's mental ability, but a loosely held term mostly used by institutional companies to figure out who's worth pouring time and resources into without slowing the economy. And this is just my own observation because with the amount we know about intelligence in this day and age, that is pretty much all it's useful for. You can't really actually define it as literal intelligence, as you'll be able to understand by the end of this slide. So the definition of intelligence today is the ability to acquire knowledge, to think independently, to reason independently, and to deal adaptably with the environment. The founding fathers of intelligence well, the first founding father of intelligence went by the name of Francis Galton and another French guy we'll get to later. There's actually a few founding fathers of intelligence, but we'll start with these two. So Galton was a cousin of Charles Darwin and was obviously influenced by his theory of evolution and wanted to observe that famous intelligent people of his time must have inherited mental constitutions, which resulted in the advanced standing in society. But he expressed a certain type of bias because he ignored the fact that these famous and talented people came from privileged backgrounds with proper nourishment and care. But still, he was one of the first scientists who began to explore the link between biology and intelligence. Galton actually proposed that the size of one's skull was related to one's intelligence, but he did not succeed in proving this, probably because in his time, they didn't really have any of the adequate instruments to measure certain types of neural activity, but we have it today. So, to sum it up, Sir Francis Galton was a cousin of Charles Darwin, and he proposed that intelligence was inherited. Our next guy was based in France, but unlike Galton, wanted to solve some problems instead of theorising. A trained psychologist who was familiar with Galton alongside his studies, he began his first major role in education by studying the intelligence of children. Why would he do this? What's the point of studying the intelligence in children? Well, this may be news to you, but as much as the education system enjoys its ordered and structured succession of year one and year two and so on, not all kids are ready for that progression. Some go faster, and some go slower, and some don't even want to go. So our French psychologist was thus hired by the Ministry of Public Education in France to try and resolve this issue, to try and figure out why there's so many differences in intelligence. So Alfred Binet went out to hundreds of schools and spoke to the teachers to gain an understanding of the reality behind what was happening in the classroom. And here's a quote by him, which I thought was quite nice. And he said that some recent philosophers seem to have given their moral approval to these deplorable verdicts that affirm that the intelligence of an individual is a fixed quantity, a quantity that cannot be augmented. We must protest and react against this brutal pessimism or try to demonstrate that it is founded on nothing. Something I very much agree with. So after his observations and discussions, Alfred Binet made two assumptions as to how the children learned and why some were more behind than others. So one was that mental ability developed with age, which is great news. It would be a little strange. Well, this is one of his observations. And his second observation was that the rate your abilities developed was constant, which means if you're learning at a fast speed at age 12, you'll continue at fast speed until you're 90 years old. Given Alfred Binet was only studying children, let's not give him a hard time for being short-sighted here, because we know today that as you get older, you know, your body starts to break down, and yeah, you're not thinking as fast as you used to, especially when you were 20. So Binet pretty much stopped there, but it was enough to start a new chapter in psychology, intelligence. On the tale of Binet, a fellow noticed that a bit of applied math could improve the practical applications of Binet's theory. He suggested that we could compare the intelligence across not only children, but also of adults, if we decided on a percentage of how far ahead that person was of their intelligence for their age, or how far back as a percentage that person was for their age. You may know this concept as an IQ score. Intelligence quotient was a formula developed by a German psychologist known as William Stern. 
The ratio of mental age chronological age multiplied by 100, that is how you find the IQ. So let's say if you're 18 years old and you get, you take the same test as the 25 year old did and you score just as well as they did, you divide, you go 25 divided by 18 for example, multiply that 100 and that'll be your IQ. So it, it sounds a little sketchy because it's like, okay, well, there's a lot of different ways to be smart. So how exactly did this guy, William Stern, decide what is smart for different ages, especially if, you know, everyone lives a different life, everyone lives in different locations. They're all influenced by different things and events. So what was he measuring? And why do we still use it today? Because it sounds a little strange. Well, the model I just described was the one used in the 1900s by William Stern. So we have much more data and a lot more accurate research on specific questions. If you take a reliable IQ test, the results will be measured across people your age, but if you perform better or worse than the tested population, this will determine your IQ. Now I emphasize on tested because the current IQ test today, they just compare you to the people who have taken the test. It's not everyone, it's not an absolute, it's just, yeah, you're smart compared to so-and-so 200 people that took this test from random walks of life. So the IQ test is something I don't really believe in, but it can certainly be used to understand your current abilities in a particular subject of life. So I think we see IQ tests in tests in academia, so I think that's sort of a species of the IQ test, if you like. Like if you get 100% on a test, you could say you've got a very high IQ. Um, I just think IQs had a bit of a warped, how to say it, view of society. They think it's a literal means of divining intelligence, but it's not. But it is certainly useful. So, so far, they look at Sir Francis Galton, followed by Alfred Binet, and then William Stern. So now we turn to 1916, because we see 1.7 million people recruited to join the US Army on account of taking a test to measure their intellectual fitness. It better be a pretty reliable test if you're going to employ 1.7 million US Army soldiers in the army. As you can imagine, not all 1.7 million people came from a place where reading, writing, mathematics were taught. So there were two versions of this test, Army Alpha and Army Beta. Army Alpha was your standard reading and writing, and Army Beta involved pictures, symbols and mazes. Depending on how well each potential soldier performed would depend on their enlistment in the army. The test used by the US military was developed in Stanford University by a fellow who came across Alfred Binet's work. Alfred Binet's work was written in French though, making it difficult to read for English speakers, so our fellow set to translate all of his work into English and making some relevant tweaks along the way. The tweaks our fellow made evolved into a new test known as the Stanford Binet test. The Stanford Binet test was the test used to help the US military enlist soldiers in the First World War. A student studying at Stanford at the time, Arthur Otis, teamed up with Lewis Terman, the fellow who translated Binet's work to English, made it possible to send intellectually fit so well, that should be put with inverted commas, because they didn't that's just what they defined intellectually fit at the time. Um, yeah, and they sent those soldiers into war. So intelligence tests were also used in Australia for the Second World War. A side effect of intelligence tests along with Gauton's work contributed to the idea of eugenics. That was quite sad but at least today we've gotten closer to understanding what it is. It wasn't long before someone noticed that intelligence shouldn't be so pigeonholed and a new test was made in 1955, not long ago at all, to test verbal and nonverbal skills. This fellow went by the name of David Weschler, whose Weschler tests are still widely used today um, and with revised new research, of course. Now you should understand the following things. The study of intelligence has been circulating for nearly two generations, which is pathetic compared to mathematics, which has been 50 generations, or like 2,500% more years. Intelligence is in its fetal stage, we're still very far from understanding it. We do understand that intelligence is not absolute, and varies depending on what the person's capabilities abilities are required for. You'll be called smart for being able to do maths at school, but an idiot if you can't plant seeds because your intelligence is localised in math. So hopefully you can see the argument there. Now you have a basic understanding of the history behind intelligence, we can move on to the next topic. How do we study intelligence today? What do we do? How do we do it? It's a very complicated answer, but you can start by understanding that, um, two main things. 
Yes, took me three slides to say that. We can understand through psychometrics, which involves numbers attempting to quantify abilities, or through cognitive ways. So psychometrics give us numbers but doesn't tell us where or why those numbers come from. So a cognitive process approach seeks to understand all external subconscious biological style, all factors which could explain why someone would perform the way they did on a given test. So let's look into some psychometrics briefly. Let's look into the cognitive process factors as well as the forgot it, psychometrics factor. The one that measures the one that uses numbers to describe people's abilities. So psychologists have noted that certain abilities, which they call factors, can be grouped together to represent a specific type of intelligence. That sort of makes sense. For instance, if you can do maths and physics well, psychologists would consider these as connected factors. There must be some sort of common thread related to your ability to maths and physics. Factor analysis involves grouping factors together such as math and physics, and any further factors which may be discovered will undergo a correlation test to see if it can form a cluster, which is quite useful. Um, and then, you know, as it happens in history, as it happens with science, you get a lot of new people who just say, well, actually, that that's not quite right. So here, along comes Spearman. And Spearman sees that there is always a correlation between all factors, no matter how weak, and that people with a higher intelligence had a stronger correlation between all factors, which he called the G-factor. Interestingly, a meta-analysis of 125 studies involving 20,352 different people showed that the G-factor was the strongest predictor of success. So essentially, the more you know of more things, the better your life will be, which is, yeah, it makes common sense, doesn't it? So along comes Thurstone, right? Here's our next scientist. Now Thurstone thinks the G-factor is a load of... Which is interesting given the overwhelming in evidence from the, the meta-analysis study. But Thurstone said that people have seven primary abilities which contribute to their intelligence, and depending how much time and resources these guys put into each of the finite seven, determines how smart they are. So that's Thurstone's theory. Further down the track, we have some smart people who put forward a clearly distinct psychometric which can be measured. Have you noticed that often older people struggle to understand how to use iPads and TVs. Generally, I know a lot of people today have a uh, fine, like older people are fine using iPads, but most people, when they first came out, it was a bit confusing. And then they deem anyone who can manipulate technology as mysterious gods of knowledge. Like if you fix something for your grandparents, like, oh my gosh, you are a software engineer. However, their memories are extensive. That's something that older people have that younger people don't. And they can distinguish different botanical species as well as recite thousands of knowledge from the past, which is really cool. It's fun. It's fun spending time with older people. So older people have more crystallized intelligence than younger people, which is why they know more than you, generally. But the reason you can figure things out, like where to plug the HDMI cable, is because you have greater fluid intelligence than your folks. Crystallized intelligence increases with age because you collect more information and it just stays in your brain. Fluid intelligence decreases with age, so your ability to form new judgments, your ability to learn and connect all the things that you learn just decreases. So kids, that's why you're put into school as soon as you can talk, because the window for you to pick up new information and apply it happens for a very short period of time. So don't, uh, with this information, don't scare your folks. The decline in fluid intelligence isn't permanent if you continuously read and expose your brain environments where fluid intelligence is. Like, just look at Tom Cruise, look at this guy. This guy's fine so if you put yourself if you your brain will do you need to understand your brain will do anything to keep you alive and if that means having high fluid and crystallized intelligence 80 due to high motivations you will have it but generally if you don't do anything like if you just carry on and don't focus on it your fluid intelligence will go down your crystallized will go up that's just the way it is revision of psychometrics so psychometrics are used to measure intelligence through numbers you um they use something Psychometrics use something called the factor analysis to try and understand which groups of skills or concepts are related. And then we had Thurstone come up with the G factor, where essentially there is a common thread of intelligence between all levels of intelligence. And then we had... was it spitting with the G factor? I forgot already. Let's, let's revise that one again. What is the G factor by Spearman? And then Thurstone was the one that refuted it and said that there's three different... There's seven different types of intelligence. Yes, I remembered it, and so have you. There, we've both done we've both done revision together. How nice is that? That's adorable. And then we had a look at crystallized and fluid intelligence. So what it is, um, and that's one way of measuring things. You know, so for example, if you quizzed someone, 
someone with someone who is younger will score less than someone with crystallized intelligence. So quite interesting there. So let's do a bit of revision, run over everything. We had a look at Sir Francis Galton, who sort of started rolling the ball with intelligence. Alfred Bonnet actually did something. Spearman. Spearman. It was Stern. Why did I put Spearman? It's not Spearman. It is Stern. Came in there. And then we had Lewis Terman, and then we had Wershler. Then we just had a look at psychometrics and cognitive means of approaching intelligence. So recall that psychologists study intelligence either through psychometrics or cognitive means. But you should get into the habit of thinking, if you ha already haven't, that everything is interconnected and as understanding of cognitive process of also does our ways of measuring intelligence and vice versa. So everything you learn in this video, it might change tomorrow, which is the same rule that applies to everything, but it's just a reminder that you should, if you are generally interested in gaining an opinion in intelligence, you should read up on it every so often. So let's start with a definition to ground ourselves. Cognitive process theories. These explore the information processing as well as cognitive processes that underlie intellectual ability. So our buddy Sir Francis Galton measuring skull sizes to see if they were related to intelligence was on the right track because cognitive process theories draw on knowledge in biology and neuroscience to help explain thinking abilities. So well done Galton. So that's not bad for a 20th century dude. So let's stop there for today. Um, I will do some more videos looking in depth into the ways that we measure cognitive processes because it is it does require a separate video. This is mainly just the history to sort of dip your feet in the water of intelligence and where psychologists are with it today. So to summarize, the beginning of intelligence was marked by Francis Galton, followed by Binet, oh, there are set up William Stern, Lewis Terman, and lastly David Weschler. We measure intelligence today through cognitive and psychometric means. Hopefully, you have a greater understanding of where science is today, where it stands in terms of intelligence. <laughs>